One album that kind of was a real big influence on me, I think it's just because we, me and my buddies, we just played it non-stop. It was like it didn't leave the turntable. And that would be RCA's release of uh, Elvis Presley's Sun, Sun Recordings. Um, that one definitely goes to the island with me. The coolest record I think that I have ever heard, the thing that made the most stunning impression on the first listen was probably Sgt. Pepper's. That just blew everybody's minds at the time. I think the first song that might have really grabbed me might have been Papa Was a Rolling Stone. I remember the beat just had me transfixed. Uh, I, was, I was hypnotized by that beat and the soulful lyrics and the, you know, the story of, that's behind the song. It gripped me even as a kid. You know? And uh, I remember the vocal harmony really uh, triggering something in me that uh, was powerful. Uh, I also got a copy of Fossils by Dinosaur Jr., which was really great, uh, red, red vinyl, and then uh, later on a girl who was mad at me broke that record over her knee because she knew that was like the one thing that would really, really hurt me. To have a guy who wanted to create uh, an independent recording studio, was, that, that's, that's quite a sea change right there, quite visionary. So Sam Phillips, the legendary sound pioneer that started Memphis Recording Service and Sun Studio, uh, he started it because he wanted to record blues musicians on Beale Street. And um, he started to get kind of a reputation around town for recording musicians that were going on to become successful. You know, this was just a studio, it wasn't a record label at the time. So he, for instance, recorded Howlin' Wolf, who went on to record at Chess Records. Um, and the records that he actually made here came out on Chess Records. They became really popular. So all of a sudden, everybody in Memphis who was a blues musician wanted to record at Sun because he knew he had connections. He uh, liked recording blues, and uh, that was a pretty much underserved market back then. That was uh, the roots of rock and roll and the roots of a lot of things we listen to today. And, uh, and there just wasn't a whole lot going on in ways of recording. So he really had a lot, he had the vision, but he also had a good place to be at that moment. I think it was luck, you know, uh, this huge culmination of country music from Nashville and Middle Tennessee and then, you know, below us in Mississippi, there was all this, you know, blues that was coming up, sort of the culmination of all those musicians coming to Memphis in one place sort of made this big bang, as we call it, of rock and roll. There's hardly a musician that anybody would know of as like, you know, quintessential 50s rock and roll that, that didn't record here. Of course, you know, Roy Orbison recorded here. He cut Ubi Doobie in this room and Rock House and Claudette, Devil Doll was done in this room. Of course, Johnny Cash. I walked the line in this room. The Folsom Prison Blues was recorded here. Uh, cry, 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 Get Rhythm. Hey Porter was done in this room. Of course, Elvis Presley recorded here. He did five records here at Sun in 1954 with Scotty Moore and Bill Black. And of course, that iconic recording was That's All Right, Mama. And that was his big break. That's when you know everybody in Memphis at least knew that this kid was going to be uh, a big, big star. But in, in Memphis, um, you know, you look at the, the, the black diaspora of moving from Delta to Chicago and that sort of thing. And Memphis is kind of on the way. You don't have to go far south of Memphis before you're in the Delta. The culture, the music, uh, guys that uh, played in, in uh, bars at that time, you know, are trying to expand their market a bit, get paid a little more, making records and things. Sam wanted to invite people from around the Delta that he'd heard about, and there was a band called Jackie Brinston and his Delta Cats, which was from, they were from Clarksdale, Mississippi, which is just the center of the Delta Blues, always has been. Um, in the band was piano player Ike Turner, who was kind of the leader of the band. and. They were invited by Sam, and of course, it was something they were excited about doing. And on the way here, there was an accident, and the guitar player's amplifier fell off of the truck, and their speaker cone was crushed, and they didn't have enough money to buy another one, and, and so, you know, they fixed it, basically. Themselves, they took a whole bunch of paper and kind of crumpled it up, and they put it into the cone of this amplifier. And the idea is that that cone was going to be uh, held shape by that paper which is what it did. Uh, when they plugged in downstairs here in the studio, it was apparent that that paper was creating this really loud, kind of cracking, scratching sound.
tone of paper amplified over the guitar tone. So in short, not a noise that people were interested in in 1951. And Sam heard this really loud kind of crunching noise of the paper over the guitar tone and he thought it was really interesting and he made it louder and so they recorded a song in the studio with that really loud cracking sound and of course that that became known as the very first ever known recording of distorted guitar uh, we have the original uh, acetate the demo the first copy of that record ever which means we kind of have the very first rock and roll record ever it went to number one in the whole country on the r&b charts that chess record did that was recorded in this room shortly after sam opened up his own record label and he called it the sun record company my father and mother had vinyl and that's all that they listened to and um, at some point my dad his generation stopped listening to the vinyl and they kind of you know went into the, the CDs and the new world when we went out of the house we started to remember the vinyl that we listened to and while our moms and dads were buying CDs we went into their vinyl that was left over I have my dad's entire vinyl collection I have a record player at my house and I don't listen to music in any other form Format, um, unless it's of course on some kind of media on the computer or something like that that you know is there just in front of me but if I'm trying to listen to music and relax or have it as background it's, it's always vinyl. In 2014 vinyl record sales hit a 20-year high approximately 1.2 million vinyl records were sold. The vinyl record in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s uh, was the only medium of release, at least, that had any quality to it. I mean, you know, there were the eight tracks and the cassettes and all that sort of thing like that, which sounded pretty awful. Uh, but the uh, vinyl record delivered high quality analog sound, assuming that it was properly mastered and, and played back on. Uh, relatively good equipment. I tell you what, I, I challenge anyone to get a a CD and a vinyl, have it the same thing and play it side by side, and and hear the the punching, the warmth, the bass is like it's just this surrounds you. There's a certain texture to the bass. There's a certain. Uh, it's so hard to put this into words. When you're listening to a vinyl record, especially if it's in a room and the whole thing is resonating, you feel something in that music that you do not feel in any other way. They're warmer. Records sound better than CDs because they're generally warmer. They say listening to a record is warm, it's immediate. Listening to uh, digital, whether it's a CD or MP3, is cold sterile or precise or clean. So what is the difference between these things? What you have when you listen to a record is you have surface noise. You have surface noise created by the movement of the stylus through the groove. And no matter how clean your stylus is, no matter how clean your record is, it's still generating a wash of white noise with that sound. When you listen to a CD or an MP3, there's also sometimes noise. It's not white noise because there's no surface to create noise, but sometimes it's, uh, it's what's called jitter or it's a, uh, a digital artifact. Let me say this, they, make, they fatigue me to listen to them. They make me tired. I, mean, I just love the sound of, of analog equipment and uh, fuzzy fuzzy warmth of the tubes, it's like a sweater, it's great. I think it just has more of a kind of a, a, a maybe a, a human quality, human hands uh, connection somehow, that, and also that it's just kind of simple, it's physical, it's a needle in a groove, um, and that's still pretty magical. I don't know, is it spiritual, is it vibe, is it explained entirely through science, I'm not sure, but there's something about the listening to a vinyl record that you do feel more. It's also just a great experience of taking something that's tangible and dropping a needle in a groove. It has that, uh, that mojo.
While colored vinyl is extremely collectible, there is actual sonic difference between them and normal black vinyl. Clear and colored discs attain more pops and degrade faster when played. Radio really started to blossom in the Depression when people could listen to music at home without paying for it, essentially. All they had to do was buy their radio set. And so people thought that records were, were going to become extinct, but that didn't happen. The two formats, the two media, developed a really close symbiotic relationship where you would have records being pressed and then within minutes, hours, days, uh, it would be on the radio. When I was growing up, Radio was one of the primary ways that we discovered new artists and learned about uh, new music. And of course, radio acted as a filter. They played what they wanted to play, but we were richly blessed in Memphis by having uh, a variety of stations. I remember when FM radio came along. It was really cool because it was stereo, it was high fidelity, and it was adventurous. These people were not looking for the songs that were on the 45s. They were looking for the deep cuts, the album cuts, if you will. And it was a way for the serious music listener to really get further into new music. In the late 60s, especially around the summer of love in 67, and, and after that, uh, freeform radio became really important. You had the DJ becoming the center of attention and, and really something of a musical figure, not just someone who pressed play. And you would have, uh, you would have these DJs playing records late into the night and playing whole albums, not just singles. You could create a record, because you could get it on the air that night. Being able to come in and record and press and run to the radio station and distribute is awfully fascinating, because it's not done anything like that anymore. And uh, Luther Ingram did If Loving You Is Wrong. We'd run to the mastering room, put it on the machine, mark the, with, uh, the beginning with a uh, grease pen get the EQ and the sound we wanted, we'd cut a reference dub, and I'd jump in my Volkswagen, run downtown to the radio station. And I think that guy played that thing 20-something straight time, straight. It would end, it, and we're trying to get, what are you doing, you know? And uh, he, he fell in love with it, and I knew it was a hit. If you then wanted to hear that music on your schedule, rather than the next time the radio played it, or after, it had run its cycle on the radio, then you needed to go buy it. And if you were gonna go buy something, it would be a vinyl record because that's, that's all it was. There was instances of going in, cutting the track, doing the vocal, overdubs, mixing, mastering it, taking it to plastics, and from the next day having a record. And we got something for you. Stax was making so many records that they couldn't possibly do them all in their one studio. So at the end of 66, the beginning of 67, just as soon as we opened the doors, Stack started sending us all of their overflow work, which was considerable. I mean, sometimes it would be, you know, weeks on end that we would be doing Stack's projects. And so we had all the Stack's writers and producers coming in uh, to work. Uh, Steve Cropper, Booker T and the MGs, Sam and Dave, Eddie Floyd, uh, Isaac Hayes. Uh, the Hot Buttered Soul album, for example, was cut at Ardent. Well, the journey of the cutting lathe to Ardent uh, really has a sad beginning because it starts with the bankruptcy of Stax in 1975. And I was used to going in and mastering records with Larry Nix on that lathe because we had a label that was distributed by Stax. And I was very familiar with uh, the equipment, the uh, absolutely wonderful job that, that it did and that Larry did in, in cutting vinyl records. John Fry called me at home and said, tell me what you think about this. What if you go over to, to Jim Stewart, tell him we'll like to take that lathe 
uh, lease it from them. They would still be making money on it. And then on their any releases they have, we'll still, we'll do it free. Jim was back in his old office. And I walked in there that Monday morning. He was sitting behind his desk. And I sat down and I just kind of ran, you know. He never looked up. He just sat and he listened to me. And finally he, uh, he looked up at me and he just went, what do you want to do, Larry? And I said, I'd like to stay in Memphis if I can. And he said, take it. And I said, you sure? And he says, take it. And that's the way it ended up here. Larry brings to his work that combination of, you know, first of all, loving and understanding music, understanding the mechanics of the equipment that he's using. And in the case of vinyl, the artful application of all the tools in order to deliver the best product to the, to the listener. So I got to keep doing what I was doing with the equipment I've always used. And I enjoyed, I still, I wouldn't be down here every day if I didn't, it still enjoy doing it. Still fun. One of the priciest records ever sold was a rare vinyl recording of The Velvet Underground. It was sold for $25,000 and is believed to be the only copy in existence. In the, you know, throughout the history of the recording industry, retail was actually part of the industry. So you would have the labels, but then you would have stores either attached to them like Stax. Stax Records, for a long time, had a retail record shop, the Satellite Record Shop, in the front. One of the great soul labels had a store right next to it that allowed the, uh, the label owners to see what exactly their uh, what exactly their music was was doing to the kids and uh, what what songs were hits and what weren't. Estelle Axton would often spend her time working in that store. And when we were kids, we would go down there and she'd pull out every stack record and every other record that uh, she had and just play a little bit one after another. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? And of course, she wanted you to buy them but she was also doing market research. Not only it was buying a record, buying music, you were buying artwork. You were buying the design, the cover. In the early, late 60s, early 70s, there was so much money washing through the record industry that uh, record labels often had uh, tax shelter label divisions and they sometimes did tax shelter projects, basically to do something that might be entertaining, but they didn't really expect to sell very many of them. So uh, some of those had the most amazing covers. One of the big records from Stax Records, one of the big LPs was Black Moses. That album folded out to a cross that was like three feet tall with um, Isaac Hayes standing on the banks of the Mississippi River with his arms down. Can you imagine how excited those people were? You got a poster included, you got phenomenal photos with many different albums. You wouldn't put a CD on the wall as art, but certainly an album would. You got this big old thing to read, and, and, and graphics, and, and, and they're really cool. The build-up, the marketing, the excitement of what was going to be on the cover of someone's album was as a much a part of the experience as listening to the music was. The top five best-selling vinyl records of all time are Michael Jackson's Thriller at 29 million copies, followed by The Eagles' Greatest Hits, Billy Joel's Greatest Hits, Pink Floyd, The Wall, and Led Zeppelin IV. It's not like stamp collecting or coin collecting. You can't buy a book and it's gonna tell you every stamp or every coin that was ever minted or printed there's going to be somebody that's going to walk in my store and they're going to have a record I've never seen. I've been looking for an Albert Brooks record for the past two years and I finally got it yesterday. 
and I was super psyched all day. That's just, you know, that happens every time you find something you've been digging for for a while. We could go and stand at the record store and flip through the crates. That was the fun, that was the decision. Well, am I gonna have this one or this one, or am I gonna wait till next week when I can afford to buy the other one? I would go to a Woolworths and I would buy 45s. And they weren't terribly expensive. I think they were less than 50 cents each. So you'd go and buy a batch of them each week and you'd bring a bag of records home. Being able to flip through the bins and maybe find something that you've never seen before or never heard of before, something that may be unique. Uh, collectors come in from all over the world. You know, we get people from Japan, people from Europe. The last few years, a lot more and more bands, new bands are putting out new vinyl. The resurgence that's taking place, largely from like indie musicians and people that really are into records for, for the sonics of them. And that's new pressings uh, with heavy, heavy vinyl, 180 gram vinyl. People like the record, people like that physical artifact, but they've also gotten used to the convenience of MP3s. Look for new vinyl, vinyl that's recently been released. What you'll see is not just the record, but you'll often see a sticker that says, includes MP3 download of the entire album. And that is, I think, a really important change. There's a small group of professionals that, that cut records masterfully well now. And these guys are dialed in, they're making good records, they're buying Neumann vinyl cutting lathes and resuscitating these machines and making great product on them again for a, a small but growing group of people that are really into it.